Okay. Добре. Въпроси? Okay, so uh, the first question goes to mainly Adam. Um, the question is about measuring the time. Is there any difference in the way you measure time when you're waiting to hear good or bad news? Uh, that's very interesting. There are lots of different ways we perceive time. If you are waiting, your, your flight is delayed or you're, you're waiting in the dentist's waiting room, time seems to go very slowly. But afterwards, when you look back at it, nothing happened and it seems to have gone in a flash. On the other hand, if you're very excited, if you're watching a football match or playing in a football match or watching tennis or something, time seems to go very fast. And yet afterwards, you can remember all the details at great length. And it all seems to have gone past in a, in a flash. So that it's, it's uh, sorry, it seems to have taken a long time. So it's perception of time depends on your state of mind. So if you're in a hurry, if you're excited, it's quite different from when you're bored, particularly waiting for a flight. If you go for a flight, you have to wait for an hour, and then they say your flight is delayed, and you just sit there, and you seem to have been there forever. So it depends on your state of mind. But it depends whether you're looking back or looking at It always depends, sorry, it also depends. At the time, waiting for that flight seems endless. Afterwards, looking back at it, it seems to have disappeared in a flash. So, and it's the opposite way around if you're excited. Окей, найс. Следващия въпрос е за... Само да успя да го прочета. Хора, как пишете просто? Не мога. Всеки път. Добре. Окей. Защо хората са по-склонни да вярват паранормални явления? Окей. The next one is for Debra. Why are people more inclined to believe in paranormal activities or stuff or creatures uh, that basically instill fear in them, such as vampires, monsters, something that has no translation, and um, is, 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 fear, is fear the thing that feeds uh, faith always? Um, I think there's a couple of questions involved there, and, and it's working out the causal relationships. In general, uh, we can look at what religion ends up doing and assuming that that is what has caused it in the first place. For example, I, I think there's an old canard which is that old religion is to cope with the fear of death. Now, it does help with the fear of death, but I don't think it's a primary mover. I think human beings are predisposed to believe in the supernatural. Um, we, ha we have a theory of mind, we know that other people go undergo experiences and we learn to understand what's going on in their head and they understand what's going in ours and we do it with animals as well and and you know higher primates and things do this sort of thing so inferring that something else has an intention and an agenda is a perfectly natural human thing to do and it's just a very promiscuous sense we tend to attribute it to all sorts of things um, hands up anybody here who's wanted to hit their computer <laughs> so <laughs> Why, why would you do it? You, you can't hurt your computer, but by God, you hate it sometimes. So, um, so there are also, that's just one example. There are lots of perfectly normal, uh, you know, well adjusted psychological processes which predispose us to, leave, to believe in the supernatural, even though it isn't there. And as I pointed out in the talk, I think a lot of the time it actually is it's very adaptive, it helps. If you've got this promiscuous sense that there is something in the environment, it's better to be a bit jumpy and for there to be something not there than to miss a tiger once, because you only get to do that once. So, um, so the, the, the fact that we are so afraid of these things, is, I, th I, think, I think you can understand it in terms of adaptive processes. And you do have to be very careful of all of the things in your environment. And that I, I, that what I see with unnatural predators and these kind of malignant creatures is that um, these are ways of perceiving things in the environment. And occasionally, the mechanisms that people come up with for coping with them end up being good and useful, truly useful. Can I add something to that? Um, when we don't understand something, we're afraid. So very often, you can reduce fear by having an explanation. And as you just said, it, in those circumstances, a false explanation will reduce your fear. Um, and that, that helps. Uh, of course, being me the way I am, I'd rather not have an explanation than be terribly frightened and worried. I don't understand. Ah! But most people would rather reduce their fear. 
с две думи. Хората се интересуват от паранормалното, защото то е по-интересно. Човек има нужда от интересни неща. Реалното не е толкова интересно, като паранормално. Или поне има по-кофти реклами, нали? Добре. Следващия въпрос е точно за професор Спасов. Добре. Относно първобитните хора. Какво бихте казали за конфликтите между неандерталците и хомо сапиенс в Европа и по света? По света нищо не мога да кажа, тъй като неандерталците са европейци. Но в Европа, да, такива конфликти са сигурно са съществували. Напоследък много се говори за това, че съвременният човек, хомо сапиенс, когато е дошъл, е притопил неандерталците, смезил се с тях и по този начин ги е притопил. Аз малко се съмнявам. Неандерталците са били наистина изключително добре приспособени към европейските условия на живот. Те са били по-добрите европейци. Но съвременният човек, хомо сапиенс, е имал по-сложна организация. Изглежда, че това е била неговата голяма сила. И честно казвам, аз си мисля, че те просто са ги избили. Неандерталката едва ли е била изключително привлекателна за нашата гледна точка, за това не смятам, че те са имали кой знае колко любовни романи. Тук тъмя може да се е случвало, но според мен просто са ги избили. Доста е депресиращо. Окей, така една друга за Адам Аген, която е възможно да е възможно, да е възможно, да е възможно, да е възможно, да е възможно. Okay. Oh no. Oh, never mind. Okay. Can uh, can the uh, can perception of time uh, either either hasten itself or slow itself or absolutely stop? Um, is it is it possible to say that we could have a we could have someone that is uh, a person that's outside time in a way? <coughs> Uh, Einstein pointed out that clocks which are moving very fast or under intense gravitational fields go more slowly. And uh, this is part of relativity and it affects us because does anyone have sat-nav in their car? Anyone here have sat-nav? Uh, yes? Um, is it called something else? GPS. Yeah, anyone use GPS? Okay, GPS depends on there being 24 satellites going round, which will beam down information to your little receiver. They'll tell you the time and where they are. That's all they tell you. And your receiver will lock onto four satellites and will be able to work out exactly where it is. But there is a problem because the time has to be very precise. They have three atomic clocks on each of those satellites and they are right to a nanosecond But because they are traveling at 17,000 miles per hour or 30,000 kilometers per hour, they are running 38 milliseconds or 38 microseconds slow every day. This is Einstein. So they run slow because they are going so fast. And this correction has to be made or your GPS would not work. It would take you straight into the river or into a cliff. So Einstein was right uh, with intense speed or under intense gravity time slows down. So if you were traveling infinitely fast, your clock would stop and you would not experience time. Or if you were at the center of a black hole or a neutron star where the gravity is enormously high, your clock would stop. If you could see out, you could see the rest of the universe flashing past, people getting old, dying, new people being born, and you would remain the same age and not get old at all. In real life, We are all getting, we are all time travelers, we are all traveling forward at one second per second. But the world champion time traveler is Sergei Krikalov, who is a Russian cosmonaut who has spent two years in the International Space Station. And in two years, he has aged almost one fiftieth of a second. He is 20 milliseconds old, uh, younger than he would have been if he had stayed on Earth. So if he stayed up there for 100 years, he would be a whole second younger. <laughs> so there you are. If you want to stay young, well, maybe you need to go a bit faster than the International Space Station. So we can travel in time, but if you really want time to stop, you need intense gravity or infinite speed. Good luck.
The next one is for Susan. Okay. Uh, what do you think of psychedelic drugs? Oh. And, uh, oh, we can all go home now. Yeah, okay, so... It do depends these, which ones. Uh, yeah, sorry, okay, do these... Okay, do these mind-altering chemical substances hold a real scientific potential for unraveling the mystery of consciousness? Well, I don't think they'll do it on their own. But, <laughs> but yes, I do think so. Um, uh, in terms of the scientific potential, there's huge medical potential. For example, drugs like LSD, mescaline, psilocybin, can really help people um, coming towards death, people terminally ill, contemplating the meaning of life, who they are, what it's all about. They really help. They were shown to do that uh, when they were first um, tested in the... Um, 1950s and 60s and then they became illegal and we haven't been able to investigate them but now at last even though they're still illegal there are some uh, licenses being granted to investigate their therapeutic powers as for consciousness well I think so because a drug like LSD um, can induce dramatic changes in the sense of self um, in fact all psychedelic drugs um, are probably to some extent entheogens which means they they it literally means release the God within. Many people think of these as kind of spiritual drugs because they, they give this profound sense of having insight. And what insight is that? Well, I'm not who I thought I was. Uh, maybe I don't even exist. Maybe I am one with the universe, which you also get in mystical experiences. Um, the self is something fluid and ever-changing. I am part of you, you are part of me. These kinds of things which feel so real at the time the drug wears off, we go back to feeling ourselves to be separated in here. But I think these are ways of loosening up the intuitions that we're stuck with, of seeing through the delusion. I think this, most other people don't think that, but you asked me, so that's what I think. Of course they have their dangers, but um, psychedelic drugs, unlike um, most other dr recreational drugs, are not addictive. Um, they ha the dose that's needed to kill you is so huge nobody would ever take it. Um, uh, it's actually impossible with LSD, um, and so. Uh, but I don't. I wouldn't belittle the fact that um, they're dangerous. Uh, bear that in mind. Um, and bad trips are terrible. Not that I, I actually have never had a bad trip, but I've seen people who have, and they're terrible. So, uh, bear that in mind. Um, but wow, the potential is phenomenal. Okay, well, sorry. Okay. So the next one Can is. I ask them a Yep. How many sure. people here have taken psychedelic drugs? We're not filming you. Mm, a few. Yeah, we are, but... Oh, yeah. are you, they're not filming them, are you? We could be. Oh, know. sorry, put your hands down, please. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the next one is for Deborah. Why are vampires of such interest for adolescent girls? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, I was on daytime TV a couple of years ago talking about this, and of course I always want to talk about folkloric vampires, I always want to talk about the horrible, smelly, uh, you know, risen corpses, but then they start going on about in twilight. And um, <laughs> there was... <laughs> And they were going, uh, the, the, the guy who was on with me was an actor, and he just kept going, and I ran out of things to say, and the thing that I finally said was, oh, well, I guess it's authorised penetration. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this was 11 o'clock in the morning on live TV. They didn't ask me back. So... Um, <laughs> So I, I think the thing is, we were talking in the break about the different kinds of vampires, the literary vampires, and when that change happened. The thing is, the vampire is a very potent metaphor, and being a very useful metaphor, it can be used for all sorts of things, and has been. And you get to the point where, where something means everything, then it means nothing. And what originally, the original folkloric vampire is a very different thing to the literary metaphor. And uh, the literary form started in the 1800s, really, a um, little bit 1700s, I suppose. But really, it, it, it grew during that time, and it has served purposes ever since. And it is just so useful that it serves all kinds of purposes. In the Victorian times, it was... It, you couldn't talk about sexuality, so it was the, the frisson of sublimated sexuality. There was domination and S&M and all of this kind of thing that you can see in those, in those um, novels. So I think that the present 
uh, rash of vampires really is, is down to the fact that it's simply a very good metaphor. It can be used for all sorts of things. And the thing about Twilight that really annoys me, actually, is that Bella is an incredibly passive heroine. Um, but, of course, she, the, the, the thing is, I suppose, that if you're 15 years old, you can't fix your space rocket or go out and spend your millions or, you know, you, you, it, it's, it's a funny time of life where you, you've got all of the urges, you've got all the desire to go out and do something. You don't really have true agency yet. You, you, it's not a lot you can make happen. So it's nice if someone simply falls in love with you for who you are rather than what you do. And uh, so I think there's... The, there's, there's that element of it, and, and just the, the sublimated sexuality, which has been part of the vampire legend um, since the 19th century. Okay, so the next one is from Twitter, and it's for Adam again. It's, um, okay, how did we end up measuring time the way we do now? Did we try various elements from the periodic table? I'm guessing this refers to atomic clocks. Ah. <coughs> How did we end up measuring time? The way we do now. The way oh, we do now. Okay. I think he's just asking about atomic clocks. Um, there were all sorts of things tried to find a really good, constant source of time. I mentioned in my talk, it was thought that a pendulum could define the second, and then they realized that wasn't good enough. And then they, they um, were able to... to hone in on various things. The quartz crystal is very useful. Pulsars were discovered in the late 1960s. Pulsars are neutron stars that rotate very fast and emit a beam of uh, x-rays or at least uh, energy uh, um, electromagnetic radiation at extraordinarily regular intervals like 1.163157 seconds. I mean really really precise. And people thought we might use these as the standard. And then it was realized that if you can collect a few atoms of some elements and let them decay, these are, these are atoms that will, you can uh, excite them into an excited state, and then they decay, they will decay at a very, very constant rate. And the perfect atomic clock, they dis discovered various elements will do this, but the per perfect atomic clock is, I believe, it may have changed, I believe, a few atoms of cesium, ideally one atom of cesium, but you can't get that, isolated at absolute zero with no other atoms around it, and excited and allowed to decay. Well, they get as near as they can to that, and coordinated universal time is actually based on some hundreds of atomic clocks in 69 different countries around the world, all feeding results in, I think it's to the National Oceanographic uh, Place in Washington, D.C., uh, where they're then averaged, and then we get this average time. So it's a very peculiar system, and it's the rate at which atoms decay when they've been excited to an excited state and al allowed to fall back. I don't understand more than that, so if you ask me any more questions, I'm completely lost. Do we have any physicists here? Yes, good, well, yes. He says it was a good answer. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> okay. Next question is for the people. We know who is with the people with us. Окей, защо се приема, че преселението на хората започва от Африка, не започва ли от Балканите и района около Черно море? Защо почва от Африка? Защото хората са създали там, където имало условия за това. Условията за това са били откритите пространства, саваните, там където двуногостта е била необходима на хората. А, че започва от Балканите също е верно, защото идвайки в Европа те тръгват от Балканите за Европа. Така че едното и другото е верно. Но по това време, когато са тръгнали през Балканите, както се опитах да ви покажа, макар и не е много успешно, а, тогава, тук условията са били такива, каквито в африканската савана. Така че хората изглеждат, наистина винаги са търсили тези условия, в които са се, в които са се създали като вид. И това е съвсем логично. При всички видове е така. And another one for Susan. 
What in your beliefs links the scientific approach to consciousness and meditation? Um, do you believe that practicing meditation would reveal the mystery of consciousness? And if yes, why? No. <laughs> I don't think it will reveal the mystery. Because science works by asking questions. If you find a mystery scientifically, you ask the question, you come up with some hypotheses, you work out a way to test those hypotheses, and you go out and find out the answer by testing them. Meditation, at least in, in Zen and some forms of meditation, has in common with science a questioning attitude. We're told in my Zen training constantly, Tan! which is the Chinese meaning investigate, investigate your mind. But one person can say, well, I found this. Another person can say, I found this. And there's no way to adjudicate between them. So it cannot be scientific. It cannot solve the mystery. What I was suggesting in my lecture was simply this. If we think that consciousness is so mysterious because we just don't know how to think about it, the hard problem, the mind-body problem, seems insoluble. We just don't know what sort of solution will come about. This is something like, in the last century, the previous one, I mean, uh, the 19th century, people were obsessed with what is life. They were looking for the elan vital, the, the life force that would explain the difference between living and dead. And now, of course, we know there's no such thing. Nobody at that time thought that, a, that chemistry would be the answer. But it turned out to be crystallography, chemistry, DNA, that really hammered home that life is not some black and white life force thing. It's self-organizing systems and so on. So I think the answer will be something like this, but we don't know where to look for the answer. So the most I would say about meditation is it may help us to come up with better hypotheses. If we stare into our own minds with long practice at calming the mind, maybe we can see through some of these delusions that keep leading us astray. Maybe we can come up better with better hypotheses. But in the end, it's got to be the science that will test those hypotheses and find out which is right and which are wrong. Okay, another one for Deborah. Are there, are there cases, are there documented cases of people uh, who have uh, drank blood for some reason uh, or, or another? <laughs> this is it. <laughs> That's it. Have there been documented cases of people who have drunk blood for a reason or other? We, um, we don't have any um, evidence that vampires have killed people. We've got evidence that belief in vampirism has killed people. There was a guy, uh, a Romanian expatriate in um, London who choked to death on some garlic that he had put in his mouth before he went to sleep because he was worried about being bothered by a vampire. <laughs> and the silly sod actually choked to death. So, um, <laughs> but yes, I mean, people do imbibe blood. There are people who symbolically go and imbibe blood every Sunday. And if you speak to a Roman Catholic, they will tell you they've actually literally imbibed blood. So it, the, the symbolism is very, very strong and people believe that they have done it. And we saw that um, Arnold Powell uh, smeared the vampire's blood on his body. Um, Edwin Brown certainly ended up eating the ashes of his dead sister's heart. So, yeah, we, we've got a lot of evidence that people have done this in rituals to try and, uh, and avoid being got at by the supernatural creature. There are also... <coughs> it, I believe the... Um, the uh, my brain's, brain's dead, it's old age, uh, Alzheimer's. Um, um, People who live in Africa, in the, in the Rift Valley, uh, the Maasai people, Maasai. I'm sorry, I've been there, I've met a lot of them, I, I, my brain is just dead. Um, they, they depend on animals, largely. They have flocks of, of cows, rather miserable cows, and goats or sheep, it's not quite clear, they're shoats or keep, um, they're sort of in between. And most of the time, when, when they have rains and so on, which they've had terrible droughts recently, they depend entirely on these animals and they eat the meat and they drink the blood, and that's about it. Um, when there are terrible droughts, the men have to take the animals away to where there is grass, and then they have to buy food and drink water from the river, and their life is miserable. But they deliberately drink the blood, and I, I think there are other 
cultures who do the same thing. Oh, black pudding. Black pudding, exactly. I was going to say black pudding. Yeah, yeah. Delicious. Mm, black pudding. So you don't drink it? No, I don't drink it. I waste for it to congeal, if that sounds more appetizing. <laughs> no. <laughs> it doesn't. What? I don't. Okay. Oh, back to Adam. Is time traveling possible? Why? Open bracket, not close bracket, question mark. Time travel. Yes. Okay, well, as I said a few minutes ago, yes, we are all time travelers. Sergei Krikalov is the champion time traveler. You can travel forward in time if you travel fast enough. If you could go to Alpha Centauri at half the speed of light and come back, you would be some days, I can't remember the sums, you would be days, possibly months, younger than you would have been if you had stayed on Earth. So you can travel into the future. It seems likely that travel into the past is not possible. <coughs> and there are two logical reasons for this. The first is we have never met anyone from the future. At least I haven't. Have you met anyone from the future? Oh, you have. Okay. Well, maybe. Uh, the thing is, if travel into the past was possible, then surely sometime in the future they would have discovered how to do it and they would have come back to visit us. The second thing is you run into the grandmother paradox. You could travel back into the past. You might accidentally kill your grandmother before your mother was born. In that case, you couldn't exist, and therefore you couldn't travel back into the past. So you run into a very rapid paradox. There are, and there are many such paradoxes. If you go back and try and change history, then the present can't be as it is, and therefore it would be different, and therefore you couldn't go back. So for those purely logical reasons, it seems likely that we will never be able to travel back into the past. But again, I defer to the physicists. Okay, if there is a multiverse, we don't have logical problems because we go back to another universe and it's not our history that we are changing, but this is just a theoretical implication, so it's okay. But it's, it looks it's, not, it's like not possible, but maybe we will find a way in the future, so it's theoretical. Uh, so that is physics bullshit. <laughs> They can explain anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, why does subjective experience exist? What advantage do uh, human? Well, okay, what advantage to human functioning does it provide um, if it has no causal powers? Uh, 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 this is a really horrible question. Um, why does subjective experience exist? Well, does it exist? I mean, I'm sorry, but it's just a horrible question that I don't know what to do with. What does it mean for it to exist? What exists in the sense that we can measure or do anything with is that I say, I can see that color over there. And you say things like that. But all we've got is what we say. Or we can do experiments and ask people, press the lever if you see this light, or you know, uh, press this button if you have subjective experience, and people press the button. All we've got is the button press, which of course is why behaviorism has been so powerful, even though now it's being overthrown, and we're going, yes, but what about subjective experience? So that's one part of the answer. The next bit of the question is really the same question as why did consciousness evolve? Why did consciousness evolve? Now, there are lots of people out there who will say, well, it evolved because it has a function. There are psychologists, some philosophers, neuroscientists saying, oh, well, the function of consciousness is to make comparisons between the air, or the function of consciousness is to um, alert us to danger, or the function of... Con but is this really the function of consciousness? No, the, the functions of things going on in the brain. You can find the neural correlates of all those kinds of things. Can you find the neural correlates of consciousness itself? People are trying. I think they can't. I think that that's rubbish. My view is that subjective experience, whatever it is, however we end up understanding it, doesn't cause anything. It isn't that kind of a thing. That was part of what I was talking about with the Lippert experiments and the whole idea of free will. The idea that a subjective experience can cause a physical consequence, it, well, it just takes you straight into the mind-body problem. If, that, if you take that line, then consciousness did not evolve for a reason. What evolved, what natural selection worked on, was 
how our brains work, how our arms and legs work, how we think, how we become deluded. Because natural selection has to see something that would make a difference to the genes. And all those physical things make a difference, so that's why we've evolved the kind of brains we have. In my view, that's why we've evolved to be deluded. But, but in no sense does it, it doesn't make sense to say why did subjective experience evolve. Someone's got a hand up over there. Uh, the, well, the problem with epiphenomenalism, or one of the problems with epiphenomenalism, is it's a kind of dualism. It's, it's like there's this thing comes out, of, you know, the brain has an epiphenomenon that then doesn't do anything. But, it, well, what is that? It, that doesn't seem coherent either. This is why I come back to this idea that, of delusion. It may not be at all right, but it's the way I'm thinking at the moment. We have the kind of brain that constructs a story that is a false story. It does it for good reasons, but it constructs a false story about what we are and adds on to all these processes or simplifies all these processes by saying there's a me in the middle that does it. And that's a delusion. So that's what's evolved, the capacity to do that, not something called subjective experience. But hey, I could be totally wrong and somebody will make some amazing discovery and then I'll go, oh, of course, why didn't I see that? But at the moment, I don't see it. You hold on to this because there's another one for you. There's still another one for you. Oh. It's from the same person. It's pretty interesting. Plus, I like the way that you squirm. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, do you think that the computer modeled after the brain could be conscious and why? Do I think what? That a computer yeah. could be modeled after the brain and would it be conscious? Well, given what I've said so far, you can think the answer yourself. The answer would be any computer or robot, it would actually have to be a robot because it would have to communicate with the outside world. So much of our perception and action and thinking depends upon interactions with the world and with others. So it couldn't just be in a black box, it would have to interact um, with the world. My answer would be that only a robot of that kind that was capable of imagining itself to be an inner being that was doing the acting and having the experiences, only a, a computer capable of being deluded in the way we're deluded would have consciousness in the sense that we do. So at least that's a, well, it's not really testable, but at least it's, it's a different answer from the one that many people would give. Most, uh, well not most, but many researchers in artificial intelligence and artificial consciousness would say, well, it's got to have self-reference, or it's got to have language, or it's got to have this, or it's got to have that. I say it's got to have the capacity to be deluded about itself. Why does time pass slower when you're stoned? <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> I would. <laughs> the conventional explanation is, uh, it, it's well known that, if you're talking about cannabis anyway in that question, um, that it shortens uh, the time span of short-term memory. So this is why you can start a sentence and you can't remember why you started it. Um, but that consequence means, as Adam was saying earlier about the perception of time, one of the ways we judge time is by the amount of the contents, and that changes as your memory is affected. So these effects have been measured. Cannabis certainly does alter time perception, but in a rather gentle and slow way. Some other drugs, the major hallucinogens, can totally change time perception from uh, minutes to hours, from hours to minutes. Cannabis does it in a rather more gentle way. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. Смятате ли, че има възможност да бъдат открити скелети на динозаври в България, както се случи преди десетина години в Унгария? Да. Доскоро това беше, смяташе се за невъзможно. Но ние в момента имаме вече останки от динозаври в България колкото и да звучи така странно. Всъщност, доколко тези динозаври са български е друг въпрос. Откраднахме ли Защото не се знае дали преди 70 милиона години, когато, да речем, те са живели тези останки, които намираме край в Северна България, дали 
тези седименти, които сега са там, дали са били в България, те може би са доплували от юг с дрейфа на континентите. Има и друга възможност, те да са дошли от север, това да са от северните континентални реки, каквито е имало в Румъния, понеже там е имало суши. Румънците си имат динозаври. Възможно е тези реки да са изхвърляли останки в морето, в тези плитките крайбрежни води и точно там да са се натрупали. Това е втората възможност. Но действително вече имаме от две различни семейства динозаври в България. Мрам. Динозаври. Аз много харесвам динозаври, просто за това ми е интересно. Не бяхме ги откраднани, пак беше окей с мен. Окей. I'm gonna try real hard. Still trying real hard. Окей. Vampires. Are there any modern deaths which are Yeah, that. <laughs> Did the vampire do it? Um, what, I, what I tend to do is I, tr I, try, I tend to call these creatures unnatural predators because I, I like the V word to be attached to the V creature. And I think if you end up saying Southeast Asian vampires or Arctic vampires or whatever, you kind of lose a lot of the information by being um, too loose with the taxonomy. And if we expand the remit away from vampires, which are very specific in terms of their habit and their location, um, into unnatural predators throughout the whole world, then yes, I, th there are, and there always will be. I mean, there are people who um, believe that children, in modern Africa, for example, uh, that children are possessed by demons and that they're witches, and they try to exorcise these children and they sometimes beat them to death. Uh, there's some dreadful things still go on. And in fact, you, you still see the same patterns again and again, which is that, um, <coughs> excuse me, these children tend to be defenseless. This isn't going to be the, the best son of the powerful chief. This is usually uh, a child who, is, who belongs to one parent family or is possibly an orphan, so they're very vulnerable. They're probably something of um, uh, a weight on the, family, on the community because they need charity. You find this with witches as well. So I think until human beings get to the point where they don't have crises, existential crises, that are brought about by economic crises as well. When people are starving, when people have epidemics, when they're unsure about their lives, that is when they go into this scapegoating mode. And under most circumstances, people will believe in the supernatural. It's very rare for them not to. And when they get into crisis mode, they tend to believe more in, su in the supernatural than otherwise. Um, so I think this is permanently with us. And it's part of the reason why it's important to understand these processes so that we can identify them where they're going on. And we can say, look, we've seen this with witches and with vampires and with werewolves. This person isn't really causing that, let's be honest. Uh, and of course, they don't have to be supernatural mechanisms where people don't believe in the supernatural anymore. They just They just come up with something else. They blame immigrants or, or whatever. It's a matter of having a scapegoat. <laughs> okay, и пак от тебе. Това, което е за астронавтите, жени. <laughs> That's a very good question, and I do not know the answer. I'm, I, I'm very sorry. I'll, I'll try and, I've never met a female astronaut yet. I've I had a long chat with a, a, a man, but I haven't met any of the women, so I haven't had a chance. Nor do I know about sex in space, so I'm sorry, <laughs> or whether the Earth moved. So I, uh, I, I, I apologize for my ignorance. Yep. Okay. So, what does hmm, 
does quantum physics play a role in psychology? Am I allowed to groan again? Oh. I assume this question refers to various theories that quantum physics in some way will explain consciousness. There are many of these theories. The most famous is the uh, um, collapse of the wave function in microtubules theory by um, Penrose and uh, Hameroff. Um, but there are plenty of other theories. They seem to go like this. Consciousness is a great mystery. There is, it's independent of time and space, and it's uh, uh, integral, and so on, so on. Quantum physics is a great mystery. It's <laughs> independent of time and space, and it's very interconnected. And blah, blah, blah. So there you go. There's the answer. Wow. Also, add to that, and I understand quantum physics, so I can baffle people and seem very, that's very rude. I shouldn't forget that. Um, forget that bit. I think it's absolute tosh. Um, for the following reason. I am not any expert in quantum physics, but I have asked various people who are about these theories, and they are not the remotest bit impressed. But my reason for thinking these theories are false is the following one. We know that it's possible that there could be such a thing as a quantum computer. We do not know whether such things exist. We do not know whether the brain is a quantum computer. It might be. It probably isn't. Probably all the processing going on can be explained in terms of uh, neurotransmission, um, both chemical and, and electrical, within the brain, but maybe not. We don't know. But let's suppose it were a quantum computer and there were really important quantum physics effects going on, effects going on at the quantum level in the brain. How would that help with the hard problem? At the moment, the problem is there's these neural firings. As I said earlier, I'm looking at my bottle of water. It's this color. We know where all the color information is going in the brain, what makes me see blue rather than green, all that stuff we know. But what about the experience? Well, let's suppose we had some quantum process going on in V4 where the color information is processed. Why would that help us with the problem of consciousness? It wouldn't. The problem remains. There's nothing I've ever seen in any of these quantum theories of consciousness that remotely helps. So I think it's a waste of time. Thank <laughs> <laughs> Нямам никакво друго обяснение. How long did it take for you to make the wooden clock? Uh, well, it, I would guess if I had been working on it full time, it probably took me a month of thinking. When I'm when I'm not quite asleep at night, I I dream about these things and try and work out what I'm going to do. And then it would probably have taken a week of actually sawing wood and carving the teeth and putting them together. Uh, that doesn't count for all the mistakes I made and when it wasn't quite round and I had to drill a hole in the middle again and, and all those things that went wrong. I don't count that. So let's say a month of thinking and a week of working, something like that. Quite a long time anyway. But it was, it was re rewarding. And you should have heard him when the wheel went bzzz, and the thing crashed on the floor and various other things went wrong. It worked a bit and then the, the trouble, <laughs> the real problem was the teeth. Getting the, um, in those days I just made myself a pole lathe. I could make something round, but drilling a hole exactly through the middle was extremely difficult. All I have is a hand drill going, you know, and you have to hold it on the, and you So getting that was exactly central was very difficult. Then I make all the teeth, I carved them all the same, and I drilled holes all the way around and put the teeth in, but they're not all sticking out the same distance from the center. And that's a difficult measurement to make. So when I put it on, it would go click, click, bzz, click, click. So then I had to adjust all the teeth with a knife and go back. And, so no, it didn't work the first time. About the 152nd time, yes. <laughs> yeah, persistence. Oh, another time question. Okay, so um, 
this time exists if you stop measuring it, and it, if it does, um, hmm, is the physical object. Sorry? Well, <laughs> this time exists if you stop measuring it, and then if it does, is it the physical object? Okay, does time exist? That's an impossible question. Uh, does it exist if you stop measuring it? Yes. Oh, I see. If you stop, does it exist if you stop measuring it? Well, <coughs> that's, a, that's a difficult question to answer. Some elements of time will carry on. The, the um, Earth will go on spinning, so we'll get night and day whether or not we measure how long it takes um, while we're on the Earth and before we get swallowed up when the sun becomes a, a red giant, there will be night and day. The moon will go on going round every, every uh, day and will become full every 29 days, so we can't stop those things. Those are elements of time and they will carry on. If there is nobody looking at the atomic clocks, then maybe they'll stop registering the time. Maybe they won't bother if nobody is looking at them. Um, but, uh, and I guess if you're not looking at your wristwatch, then, oh, I'm not wearing it. So for me, time doesn't exist. There is, there is no time on me. I can't tell what the time is. Obviously, uh, seconds and minutes and nanoseconds and so on are, are elements of our creation. Uh, clock, uh, dogs and cats don't bother about nanoseconds. Um, they don't bother about weeks either. The week is also an element of just human uh, creation because there's no of it's roughly a quarter of a month. But it's not any, there's no astronomical thing. So the astronomical things will go on. The clocks will probably go on ticking away, the atomic clocks and the quartz clocks. But if nobody's looking at them, I guess it doesn't matter anymore. If we're all wiped out by a wonderful species of bird flu, then I, you can't imagine your cat going and looking at the clock and saying, oh, it's time I fed myself, can you? <laughs> It, uh, time doesn't work like that for anything except humans, so probably it wouldn't matter if there were no humans, it wouldn't matter whether the time was being measured or not. Have I answered that question? Oh. I love that question because I'm thinking, does consciousness exist if you're not asking yourself whether you're conscious? <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, Да. Окей. Каква е вашата позиция относно така наречените скокове в еволюцията? Тази поддържана от Стивен Джей Гулд, който се аргументира най-общо с камбрийската експлозия и като цяло от коя страна на този въпрос се намирате. В допълнение, е ли е човека плод на еволюция или на внезапен скок? Дали е плод на еволюция човека или на внезапен скок? Да, въпросът е много интересен, тъй като е свързан с... поне за мен е интересен. Не знам за другите. Свързан е с съвременното състояние на, на представата ни за еволюцията. Всъщност, всъщност не е Джейн Гулд този, който пръв обръща внимание на тези явления. Това е още Шмалхаузен, съветски учен от немски происход, който е писал трудовете си не само на руски, но и на немски, поради което беше редно американците да са го прочели, но те не са. Затова сметат, че Стивен Джей Гулд, човек, който беше изключително интелигентен, е създателят на тази теория. Мисля, че той е прав. В еволюцията няма постепенно и бавно натрупване. Това ние виждаме по тези видове, които наричаме живи фусили. Всичко зависи от условията на живот. Ако един вид е приспособен към условията, той няма причина да еволюира. Той може да стои така хиляди, стотици хиляди, може би милион и повече години. Но тъй като винаги нещо се променя в условията, тогава видовете, които са наоколо, започват да се надпреварват кой ще успее в тези нови условия. Често пъти успява не този, който можем да си представим. Всичко зависи какво точно трябва да се промени. И тогава за това време на промяна, то може да бъде много бързо. То може да бъде един вид, може да стои 300 хиляди години по един и същ начин да изглежда и за 10-15 хиляди години да се промени в друг вид. Всъщност еволюцията е точно това. 
човекът, да, разбира се, съвременният човек съществува 200 хиляди години. И той от тогава не се е променял. Ако си мислите, че ние сме по-интелигентни от тези хора на 200 хиляди години, лъжите се. Те са имали същият мозъчен капацитет, същите мозъчни възможности. Ние знаем повече, но ние не сме по-еволюирали от тях. Всъщност човешката еволюция е спряла тогава, когато човекът се е адаптирал. Мит е това, че ние сега еволюираме. А цялата линия на човешката еволюция, ето, например, неандерталците, те са известни, може би, може би от преди 150-200 хиляди години също, но те са еволюирали само тук, в Европа и са били унищожени от нас. А преди това, Homo erectus, най-ранните са, както можахме да видим, на около 2 милиона, 2 милиона и половина, може би, години. Те са съществували в Ява до преди 30 хиляди години. Продължавал да съществува този вид. Там, където условията са били такива, каквито той е познавал. Така че, лично аз, например, не вярвам и в молекулярния часовник, в това, че той може да каже преди еди колко си време тези видове са се разделили. Това не е възможно да се каже, защото видовете и еволюционните линии се движат с различна скорост. Забавят скоростта тогава, когато видовете са се приспособили, престават да еволюират въобще и след това за десетки хиляди години могат да се променят изцяло. Да, действително, аз съм съгласен с Стивен Джей Гулд, както и с Шмал Хаузен. Мисля, че тяхната представа за еволюцията е верната, правилната. Окей. И един последен въпрос, който отново ще е към Сюзан. Окей, сега Сюзан, това е график. Okay, this is readiness of action, the graphic you, you mm -hmm. had up. Is this the same when action is not expected? For example, we're trying to protect ourselves from a flying object. No, it really isn't. Um, uh, sorry. I was looking for something to use as a flying object, but you will expect it anyway, so there's no point. But um, if a flying object is coming towards you, let's suppose I throw a flying object at you, you'll probably go like that. Now, that reaction will be coordinated by the dorsal stream, which is a, a large amount of information going forwards from the, the visual cortex at the back of the brain here. Dorsal stream goes forward to the motor cortex very quickly and will there coordinate protective actions, shutting your eyes, raising your arms, ducking out of the way. Those things happen very quickly. Um, other things, like if, if the flying object is a paper airplane or the flying object is a bottle of water, you'll just go like this anyway. That happens too fast, long before you know what the object is. The ventral stream, the information is going in a different way to the parietal lobes where object recognition takes place and takes a lot longer. And that, um, I mentioned this in, briefly in the lecture, that's the point at which you'll be able to say it was a bottle or it was a flying, aer it was a paper aeroplane that's much slower. There are other processes going on all at different kinds of times. What that Libet thing was trying to do and there are so many arguments about why it didn't do what he thought it did and so on, so on, so on. But what it's trying to do is take the timing of when you subjectively feel you want to move and measure that against other things. When you duck from a flying object, you do that before you can say anything about subjectivity. And I worded that carefully. Okay. Ами, с това попереключихме. Остава ни още едно, два пъти по-голямо тестенция с въпроси, което ще отговаряме лека по лека в Фейсбук. Надявам се да успеваме с всички, но зависи от тях, не им казвайте. Благодаря много, че заведохте. Има впечатляващо много хора останали, които ни издържаха. Ами, това беше. Надявам се до следващия път.